ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Any sport needs support and without the support, the number of athletes doesn't grow. On the other hand, when the number of athletes doesn't increase, it's difficult to get support. I think the sumo world is in this spiral right now and I hope it can get out of that spiral somehow. In your mind's eye, when you think of things that are quintessentially Japanese, what do you see? Mount Fuji, karaoke, ramen, kimonos, cherry blossoms, sake. Eddie Jones, what about sumo? The ancient sport is deeply intertwined with Japanese culture, but it's facing something of a crisis. If it's to survive, they might have to do something radical. Embrace a new generation of female talent. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily. James Oden is the ABC's North Asia correspondent. He has gone inside the world of sumo wrestling for foreign correspondent. James, for the uninitiated, can you explain what sumo is and the place it has in Japanese culture and society? Well, the rules of sumo are very simple. You simply want to push your opponent down onto the ground, make them buckle, or you push them out of that ring that people have seen, the dokyo. That's as simple as it gets. It's a sport of split-second decisions because you only get one shot, but it's a ruthless sport. So in terms of its place in Japan, well, it's really Japan's most iconic sport. It's been around for at least 1,500 years or 2,000 years. And, you know, one of the stories is that it was there when Japan was founded. This is a mythological tale, of course, but the story goes that there were two gods that fought on the shoreline of Japan for the country's sovereignty. And the winner got Japan and its followers inherited Japan. Throughout its history, of course, so it has changed its purpose and meaning. It's been a form of celebration, entertainment, It's taken on militaristic elements. It was a form of training for the military and a symbol of nationalism. But what we see today in sumo came about after the Second World War when Japan moved from an imperialist country to a pacifist country. And they played up the sporting elements of sumo. It is a sport. There are competitions. There are winners and losers. But still, the governing sumo association really emphasises tradition. And I assume that's kind of central to my next question. Can you explain why it's so male-dominated and why the governing body is reluctant to change? Well, there have been women competing in sumo or participating in sumo, I should say, throughout its history, but particularly during the late 1800s, the turn of that century, it's an era in Japan known as Meiji. And it's when Japan looked at the West and thought, that's modern. That's what we've got to be to survive in this world. Women were pushed out of the sport. It was just a men's sport. That's what happened during that time. And in terms of where it fits in now, it's only the last 20 years that women have returned to sumo. And it came about because Japan, or the city of Osaka specifically, was trying to host the Olympics. And the idea was pushed that if we host the Olympics, we're going to have sumo as an Olympic sport. Therefore, we'll need men and women involved in the sport. So that's how a lot of women started to get involved. And that's when these amateur competitions started to come about. But there is a huge gap between the men's side of the sport and the women's. The men's side is called Ozumo. That's the professional men's league. There's nothing at all like that for women. Men can earn an income in Osimo. They comply with this strict regime of you have to live in a stable, a sumo stable with other wrestlers. Uh, You train with them, your competitors, your friends. It's your whole life. And you don't get much respect and much income unless you're a top sumo wrestler. For women, there's nothing. And of course, there's no Olympic sport. It never happened. Uh, There's been a real reluctance from the Sumo Association to promote that sumo should be an Olympic sport. It's basically they don't want to lose their identity. 
because it is a Japanese sport, uh, it, you know, once, once called the national sport. But what the women really want is just something where they can get respect and recognition and the ability to dedicate themselves to this sport. I often wish that sumo as a modern sport for women and men alike could become a profession or reach a level where people could earn a living. If we look at, for instance, in Australia, footy, cricket, soccer, it's been an explosion of interest and support uh, for the women's versions of these competitions. And I'm not saying it's resolved all the issues or it's you know perfect, but it's, it's come a long way in the last five to 10 years. But sumo here, women's sumo, people just don't even know it exists. I was having a chat to someone a few weeks back 60-year-old uh, Japanese woman explaining what I do. And just as, as an example, I said, I've got this documentary coming out on women's sumo. And she laughed and said, oh, is it a comedy? It just gives you an idea of how far away women's sumo is from being even acknowledged here in this country. James, as the program shows, sumo is facing something of a crisis, particularly around participation. Kids in Japan perhaps not seeing the sport as being as cool as baseball, basketball, soccer. Parents concerned about injury risks. So a potential way of growing the sport is through female involvement. Can you tell us about Hiori Kon and why she's a microcosm for the challenges many women are facing in this space? Yeah, so, I mean, as you say, participation rates are dropping it is considered less cool because people look at sumo and go, well, hang on, I have to be overweight. I have to live in this stable. I probably won't get any real income living at this stable unless I'm one of the best. That doesn't appeal to me at all. Instead, look at baseball, look at soccer. You earn a great income, you're you're cool. It's much more attractive and parents are more interested in that sport. So participation rates are dropping. Last year's intake for new sumo apprentices to break into this sumo stable system, which you have to start off in, uh, was called the worst ever by Japanese media, the worst. If this was any other sport, for instance, in Australia, there'd be crisis meetings. Without kids being involved and wanting to be involved, that just spells trouble. In terms of women, Hyori Kon, she's probably the most famous female sumo wrestler. She rose to fame partially because of her uh, efforts in the doyo and at these amateur competitions worldwide. She was a star of a Netflix show and made into the top 100 women for a BBC top 100 women count. So she has probably the biggest following. But since these things have happened, this is pre-pandemic, pre-2020, uh, she was at university at the time. Now she's working an office job. And so here you have this kind of contrast, this woman who attracts global attention. Even when we were filming her, there's a French magazine there as well photographing her. She gets global attention. She's been this beacon for change and attracting you know, interest in sumo, but she gets zero, zero from the government. And she has to work an office job, which as we all know, uh, office jobs here can be quite gruelling. The hours are infamously long. So she has to work that five days a week and then find the time to train and compete. In terms of sumo, men have choices in universities and men have a wide range of choices. Women really have to go and look for opportunities on their own. And for most women, that's just too tough. And so they will find one of the few sumo clubs at school that they compete in, Then when they go to university, there's even fewer places to train. But once you leave university, it's just too much. And the pressure to have a career, get married, have kids is just too much. And Japanese women face this wall or a cliff and they have to leave. People would say, do you think about getting married or having a baby? Sometimes I feel like I'm being defeated by these voices. So she's actually now taking a break. Uh, from competing. She's going to Argentina, funnily enough, to promote sumo over there. But this world championship that we filmed her at was her last kind of stand to make a big lasting impression. And then hand the baton over to the next generation of women leaders. I couldn't reach one more stop, but I think I've left something for the next generation. I'll leave the rest to the young people in Japan. It's sadly ironic that ultimately she's going to another nation 
to sort of pursue sumo as a career. Um, but there are examples of others who might be having better fortune and leading to renewed efforts towards change. Well, even interestingly enough, the job in Argentina is with the Japan aid program and was advertised for men. And she said, well, hang on, and, and challenged it and went to the Argentinians and said, look who I am. Can it be for women too? And they said, of course, we'd love to have you. So even that, the default was, here is a job to promote sumo abroad for men only. And she challenged that. At her workplace, it had a sumo club, which isn't terribly uncommon here. There are sumo clubs attached to corporations. And it was men only until she entered. So it's been tough for her. The other character we meet is Rhea Hasegawa. You know, she's, I guess, a bit of a break from tradition. She's a breath of fresh air in some respects. And she feels that, you know, you don't have to live, breathe sumo all day, every day for it to be important. She thinks sumo is cool. Uh, she's in, she's 20, she's at university. She knows that when she finishes university, there is that cliff, as I mentioned before. I knew that there was no professional career path for women in sumo since I was young. But right now she's competing and trying to be a global figure as well. But just as an example, she dyed her hair red. Now red is a break from the traditional black hair look of sumo. So I thought, I don't want to give up on my hobbies or fashion. And I want to enjoy taking care of my appearance. And so that in itself is the kind of mentality I can imagine will really resonate with younger girls today. You can be yourself and still compete in sumo. And I think sumo is cool and I'm going to keep promoting it as well. It's a fascinating story. Uh, if people want to watch it, they can catch it on iView, Foreign Correspondent, coming your way. James Oaten, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Alex Dimonor has defeated Rafa Nadal in straight sets to eliminate the Spaniard from the Barcelona Open. Well played, Alex Dimonor. An excellent job, straight sets. And if it is to be, farewell, Rafa Nadal and goodbye, Barcelona. Everyone will remember the man who's won 12 titles here. Nadal is continuing his return from a debilitating hip injury, and the 37-year-old showed glimpses of his old self. But after losing the opening set, he took it easy as he seeks to build towards the French Open. We have our Champions League semi-finalists. Manchester City and Arsenal were knocked out by Real Madrid and Bayern Munich, respectively, who will now face off for a place in the final. Madrid beat City on penalties, while Bayern won 1-0 to go through 3-2 on aggregate in the other half of the draw. Paris Saint-Germain will play Borussia Dortmund for a place in the final. The Australian Swimming Championships are underway and Kayleigh McEwen has broken Stephanie Rice's 15-year-old national record in the 200-metre medley. The time of 2.06.99 is the fastest in the world so far this year. And the NBA has banned Raptors player John Tay Porter for life after he was found to have bet against his team in games where he was not playing. He also passed on information about his health to someone who stood to make more than one million US if he underperformed. Naughty. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily, produced by Poppy Penny. Thanks to the ATP for the extra audio used in this episode. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.